to a professor's life your weekly peek inside the ivory tower i'm chris with me on this show is robert hello and steven i am also here all right so we're all here we're all ready to go and this show's topic is going to be the dreaded disease of senioritis i'm too tired to talk about this yeah i mean it's like we're almost close to the end of this podcast so why do i bother (laughs) I don't care. I'm already in grad school. (laughs) Doesn't matter anymore. I've got a job. Yeah, a job. I have a job now. Now, credits graduate. I don't need your class. That's right. That's right. I'm gonna be getting out of here making more money than you're making right now in three months. Yeah. Oh, that's the worst, man. (laughs) (laughs) It's happened. It's happened to me so many times. Um, so. Yeah, the start of disease, senioritis, when students start to check out at the end of their last semester, how do you keep students engaged or maintain the integrity of a class, especially a class that is loaded up with seniors? Mm. Fun times. Fun times. <laughs> and every one of us has been in a situation at one point or another uh, to one degree or another. And it's also as a professor as you get sort of upset with your students don't forget that at some point you've had senioritis too every one of us has gone through this whether it's at the end of your uh, undergrad grad even if you're like between jobs and you're like huh, what can i do fire me well, i'm leaving <laughs> anyway so you know we've all gone through this like apathy and there's different reasons for it um so why don't we um, start uh steven um, yeah how do you go about dealing with a class full of uh, senioritis, whether it's grad students or undergrad students? Right. Um, you know, I, that, that's one of those interesting spaces. Um, now that I'm teaching in the uh, MBA program here, I almost exclusively teach people who are finishing up. Um, they start off, some of them are looking for jobs. Um, some of them already have jobs. The ones that already have jobs are really checked out. So this is, this is what I live through. Uh, In this world, I mean, the whole thing is to try to, in my mind, keep it to what can they walk out of here? Why why should they be in the class today? And what can they walk away with today that keeps them engaged? Um, You know, I take it as a one-day battle. It's like dealing with children. Uh, I can't worry about the future. I can't worry about, uh, you know, future wins or or marshmallows or something like that. For those who have the psychology background, you get that reference. Um, This is really about today you will do something. And today you will get something that you will actually find useful. Uh, now I have an advantage. I teach negotiation, which means they could actually walk away with a, with an actual skill. And, and so I think that's not necessarily fair uh, for everybody else. But uh, if you're teaching those things as you, Chris, you're teaching at, at, at a more theoretical level at times. I mean, you're talking about sort of base uh, physics. I could see how that would be a little bit harder for somebody to engage into if they just didn't care at that point. Yeah, it, it kind of depends. So the students who are going into graduate school or they're in a class that would be directly related to their employment afterwards um, tend to care a little bit more. Those who are going into something completely different, you know, it's kind of hard to say, hey, this is going to be really important to your future when probably not. <laughs> <laughs> non-majors. Not, yeah. Yeah. Non-majors or even the student who might be a major who simply isn't going into physics after graduate school or after, excuse me, after um, college, they might be completely different field. And if they've lost interest at that point, then, you know, it's, it's tough to justify. So uh, how about you, Robert? Uh, I'm sure you run into this too. Yeah, I do. I do a mix of things. I do a little edutainment, you know, so just try to keep them entertained so they don't completely check out. And then I start teaching a lot more like it's an executive class, you know, the what can this do for me on Monday uh, attitude that Stephen has. Um, Give them one thing they can take away from the class and tell them there'll be something that they can take away from the class. They tend to flow a lot better. Um, I dislike teaching in the spring to graduating <coughs> seniors because I prefer to teach in an arc as opposed to a bunch of little, it's like TV, a bunch of little one-off episodes, you know, monster of the week. Uh, I prefer to have the arc and maybe have a build and have more control over the entire learning experience, but there's not much you can do. They'll just check out. Mm-hmm. Or you can just call them a bunch of entitled little shits and let it go, but probably not the best way. Not, not if you're looking for positive evaluations or pats in the back from your department chair. Yeah, but if you're in your itis and you're between jobs. 
Well, you know, um, it's you're right. It's kind of a spectrum there because you'll have students who uh, may be still very interested in the subject, so they're not going to check out, right? And then you're going to have students who are going to check out regardless of what you do. And I, you know, I guess at my position is generally they're adults, mm. and every time and or every job you have, there's going to be parts you don't like or parts you think that are irrelevant. And guess what? You just got to do them, and you got to do them well anyway. So this is excellent practice for the grown-up world of uh, doing those kinds of things. Yeah, the the biggest problem I have in the spring if I have students getting senioritis is if it's a group-based course. Have to deal with way more free rider issues. Got right. to get a lot more aggressive on that up front. You know that I won't tolerate free riding. I'll let people fire their teammates. Mm -hmm. um, I tell them I I never had to do it, but I've told them this for well more than ten years. If someone's big enough trouble, I'll just yank them out. We can watch them fell on their own and laugh at them. Ah, oh. but this this the, the thought of the public humiliation, yeah, public shaming, yeah, really cuts down. I never had to do it. But it, it's cut down uh, a lot on the group work. If I really stress that, and then I remind them a couple times during the term, you know, that hey, you know, I'll even make a joke of how many of you are graduating seniors, how many of you have a job. Okay, look at the people that still have their hands up. Those are the people that are going to totally blow their group work on you in the next term. <laughs> uh, and that can be pretty effective too, because you know it's like a pre-correction. But I think it's a really good point, though that you bring up here, Robert, which is that you address it up front. Uh, if you go into the idea of saying, nah, I don't know if there's going to be senioritis, I don't know if anybody's going to check out in the spring of their last year in grad or of undergrad or grad school, then you could just get smacked. Um, you know, I think you're saying you prep it on day one. Chris, you said you basically tell them if you're starting to slack, look, real world, you know, wake up time. This is a life skills class right now. And you're going to see how you act in the real world. Uh, and I think that's a great way to get with this. And we have to just make sure that you don't come in here just, everybody's going to love everything that they do because I'm a wonderful professor. You may be the greatest, most engaging person in the whole world. And there's still somebody who says, I have no need to be here. I don't know why I'm here. Uh, I'd rather just do something else because uh, Chris sent on a nice, uh, sent on a nice uh, article today uh, about this topic. One of the things I thought was nice was that they actually pulled and interviewed some people who were going through this. They were actually, you know, in social media. They, you know, talking about their senioritis on Twitter a lot. Um, but one person actually talked about how, you know, look, there was social engagements are ahead of uh, academic requirements at this point in my, my career. I mean, I'm just, I'm finishing up. I've got to get myself prepared for the next phase of my life. I need to spend this last time with my friends because there's a good chance I won't see most of them again as we scatter to the other edges of the earth. I can let this slip because I've already done a good enough job in college to get through this. Um, I, what, I, what I really liked about that article was this notion of it, they're not doing this necessarily because they're evil people. Um, they're not doing it because they're jerks. It's because at the end of the day, there's other concerns that are coming up that preempt academic issues. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a big time for a student because they are applying to jobs. Uh, they may be networking beyond friends. They yeah. may be trying to go to, you know, from one interview to the next. And they may be thinking about the long game here. They should be thinking yeah. about the long game here. And they figured, well, I've done, a, you know, pretty well up to this point. I can just, you know, cruise on out the last few weeks or whatever the case may be while I focus my attention on, uh, quite frankly, what can be more important long term things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And especially uh, depending on where you happen to be. Uh, I don't think it's going to be as big a deal here, but I know it definitely was in, uh, you know, in the more towards the middle part of the company country. April hits, weather finally starts to get nice, mm -hmm. and if you're senior, this may be the last month that you don't have to pull a nine to five. Right. So yeah, you want to take advantage of the weather if nothing else. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, coming back a little bit just for a moment uh, about sort of dealing with the assignments, I tell students in group work, uh, I give a certain type of group work activity where everybody in that group gets the same grade regardless. And I tell them, I don't really want to hear if you have slackers because in the real world, you might be on a team, a committee, or in a subgroup of a company that you're just making up for somebody. You know, they're picking up their slack all the time. That's just the way it works. Is it fair? No, because everybody the same credit at the end. Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't give the same grade. Yeah. I let them grade their teammates. 
So uh, if they say they did 80% of the work, I give them 80% of the grade, 80% of a B is a D. Mm -hmm. So at least I give them that level of control because you do have some 360 review processes and some other ways that you can do something about crappy colleagues or mm -hmm. they really can't do as much. It's the same reason I tell them, feel free to come and tell me you're firing a teammate. Um, and then pff, you're fired, you're out, you're on your own. You know, sucks to be you. Hmm. Fair enough. So, um, do you ever find that the actual senioritis has been so disruptive to a class that it shuts you down? No, but I'm very aggressive in the classroom. So I, I could see a professor getting walked all over if they were new, though. Hmm. Testing boundaries, yeah. You can push, and you don't really. You're worried about the, you know, the holy student team evals and right. the SRTEs or whatever they're called at your institution. And if you're new, being such a slave to that, I think could really bring a new professor down. Uh, I've definitely seen it when uh, looking at reporting of SRTEs. They're almost always lower in the spring. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just for me, looking at departmental ones almost always lower in the spring mm -hmm. um I, I my sort of experience one of the things i i've tried to do is because i i force engagement um do, again doing negotiation they show up and they have to act there's not a uh you know sit around in the corner with your head down they have to actually negotiate uh i remember this very very clearly from a couple years ago i had an 8 a.m on a friday morning class two and a half hour class 8 a.m um, as you can imagine, that isn't necessarily the best time for outgoing seniors. But a person came up to me at the end of the semester and said, you know, I, I really want to thank you for everything. Um, you know, not, not just that I learned things, but actually you saved me a lot of money this semester. I'm like, well, oh, good negotiation skills came to, came to pass. I'm, no, because, you know, on Thursday nights, my friends were out all night, but I had to get to bed by, you know, midnight or something like that. So I couldn't stay out at the bars as long because I had to make it to your class at 8 a.m. You know, and I took that as a positive. I said, that's a really good thing, you know, but that also was because they had to show up and they had to be a part of this, even if they wanted to quit and they wanted to go and do something else. Um, their grade went down so rapidly that that there wasn't a way out of it. Um, you know, again, I'm not a person to say you, you show up just to show up, but rather because you have to be there and do something, your grade starts to reflect that missed activity. Have you had a class go off the rails, Chris? Uh, no, not for senioritis. Um, I mean, I guess not in college level. At uh, When I taught high school, I had a course that was called Tech Prep Physics, and it was for students who were not going to college. It was to prepare them for technical careers. Uh, it was a non-math based, it was like a conceptual physics course, and that was chock full of seniors, several of whom had taken the course for like the third time, it seemed like. Uh, and they had definitely came down with senioritis, many of them. Uh, and yeah, that was, I, I don't want to say it went off the rails, but it was definitely a challenge to keep them motivated and focused on what they should be doing um, in the class. Yeah, I could see that. You have a lot less tools as a high school teacher, too, than you do as a college professor. Right. Yep. You have so, a lot more freedom and power and control. Yeah, and so at that point, what I had done was shift the class completely to daily activities. Uh, so basically, moving away from the arc, right, right. that you talked about earlier, <laughs> and said, okay, we're going to play today, and this is the game we're going to do. You know, and, and I mean, I don't mean by game like you know Monopoly or something like that, but there would be a, game a very focused lab activity where they would be just doing stuff instead of listening to stuff. Yeah. Well, I guess there was the one term I did have it go off the rails because of me where halfway through the term, I was bored and decided to teach a different class. That's not a good example to set. Yeah, well, it, it worked really well. I got my highest SRTs in spring ever because I was mm -hmm. teaching what I was interested in, so right. they got more interested in. So I asked them, none of them were particularly interested in the course topic as it was, so I came up with a better idea and they liked it. Well, there you go. Now and then I stopped teaching that course. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was like 26 times. I was done. Oh, wow. Yeah. that That's a lot. That's yeah. a lot. Of time. I just couldn't keep it fresh for myself anymore, <laughs> even though I kept redoing the course. I needed a new topic. Fair enough. Now, I think it's important, too, to differentiate between um, the senioritis of a student who is good 
or has been good. And the senioritis right. of a student who uh, has been pretty much a slacker for most of their four years or six years, whatever it's been in graduate school or undergraduate school. And I think for the good student, senioritis can be one of those so-called teachable moments where you can sit down, talk to the student and say, all right, you know, sort of like what I was saying earlier, this is, this is a normal sort of phase in life and what you do and how you handle this says quite a bit about your character and how other people will perceive you in the future. You know, if you come back to me, let's say for job number two wanting a recommendation, or let's say the job doesn't work out and you need, you know, for whatever reason you need a recommendation for me, it's going to be hard for me to say, hey, he's got really good follow through. Right. Yeah. Because when the chips were down, they didn't deliver. Right. Has a wonderfully short attention span. Hmm. Yeah, or you know, doesn't isn't focused on yeah. on the goals, on short term goals. Yeah, right. as we know, letter recommendations uh, aren't aren't particularly predictive of anything unless they're negative. So if you get something negative in there, uh, that's a bad sign for that person. You really need to avoid hiring them. Same sort of deal. If you the best person you can ask for a letter recommendation said. They came to my class occasionally, and when they were there, their head was down. Yeah. yeah. I love punctuality as the, nah, as the positive negative in a yeah. recommendation letter. Oh, yeah. yeah. They always showed up. Yeah, uh, yeah no, but, you know, it, it does say something to an employer where uh, if this individual deems something to be irrelevant to them, right. that they don't put the effort in. Yeah. yeah. And that make, that's, that's one of the standout sort of characteristics between someone who's good at what they do and someone who is not as good as, at what they do. Because those good people that are good at what they do, they will grind through the crap to enjoy what they want to do. Yeah. A person that's not willing to grind through the, what they perceive to be the crap work, uh, it's kind of hard to rely on them. Yeah. Well, they definitely should never go to grad school. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Going back to last week's, nice callback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you can't jump through hoops. Right. Well, and when the chips right. are down or you get the negative feedback of being a professor. Yeah. Yeah. And there's always hoops to jump through regardless of what you do for a living. Right. And there's always crap work. Yeah. It's right. just the nature of life. Right. Uh, so I think it's important if you see a good student who is exhibiting this sort of behavior, to sit down and talk with them and just say, hey, you know, uh, I understand you've got a million different things going on and you are splitting your focus but you want to take a step back and think if I'm shortchanging this area, how am I perceived in that area? And what could be the long-term effects of, of, of shortchanging? Yeah. And a good student will be, okay, yeah, I want to think about this. You know, that not so good student, they're not going to care um, one way or the other. They're just right. trying to go, you know, D for diploma. That's what they're, <laughs> they're shooting for. <laughs> yeah, they'll remind you that you weren't their one phone call. <laughs> right. Fair enough. So, all right. Well, senior itis, folks. Uh, I. Sorry about that. That was. And we're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the timer has gone off. The egg. Yeah. Is... Yes. Uh, the the uh, timer went off. I think we should probably uh, wrap up this episode <laughs> at this point. I apologize for that. This is the uh, <laughs> professional podcast in here. Uh, so if you like what you heard tonight, uh, or whatever you're listening to this, uh, if you're looking show, to buy an analog phone, talk to Chris <laughs> yeah, as well, uh, ignoring the, uh, the phone ring, uh, <laughs> please click like, or subscribe, check us out on iTunes, YouTube, check us out on the web, jestercat.com, uh, tweet us at a prof's life and, uh, email us at a professor's life at gmail.com show ideas, comments. We'd love to hear from you until then. Let's get back to writing. <laughs>